<laughs> you say you want a revolution, well, you know. We all want to change the world. You say you want a real solution, well, you know. We're all doing what we can. Oh, man, imagine if we were just in the world of the Beatles. Like the Beatles, think about the Beatles for a second. They were entering the unknown. They said, everyone's got short hair, let's go long hair. Everybody's playing this kind of music, let's play that kind of music. They were entering the unknown. Think about that. From the unknown to the known, and now they're known. At what point did they go from being unknown to known? What day was it? What record was it? What song was it? You don't know, but they did. They transformed music over time. Think about that for a second. Imagine if this conference was called Enter the Known. Who would come? Come, everything you're going to hear, you already know it, and just come and hang out on a Saturday. Who would come? Entering the unknown is not always a bad thing. It's a tough time here in Japan. We all felt it around the world. And we know that there are more questions than answers moving forward sometimes. But trust me when I say entering the unknown is not a new thing. Entering the unknown happened since the dawn of civilization. And how does mankind, womankind, kidkind get from the known? How do they come out of the unknown, back into the known? They ask questions. Think about this guy, right here. Anyone recognize him, the caveman? All right. Check, check, there we go. So he's sitting in his cave, and every time he came out of the cave, he was entering the unknown, right? Watch out for the woolly mammoth. Don't let the woolly mammoth eat you, but come back with food. What? So he steps out of the cave, and one day he says, hey, what if we eat the woolly mammoth? What if the hunted becomes the hunter? He asks the question, and guess what? He went from the unknown to the known. Think about this guy in the 1600s asking questions. The most profound question known to mankind in the 1600s, hundreds of years ago. To be or not to be? That is the question, whether it be nobler to suffer the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune. Think about this guy. He's asking questions. To be or not to be? What's the answer? I say it's to be. This guy, he shows up in the 60s. An intersection point in the United States. An intersection of civil rights. There were issues around the world. The country had way more questions than answers. And he stared a nation down and said, ask not what your country can do for you but what you can do for your country. Profound at a time when a nation needed to hear that. He challenged it. And then my good old friend shows up right around the time I was born, Bob Dylan. <laughs> he made a living out of asking questions. How many roads must a man walk down before you call him a man? He said the answer was what? Blowing in the wind. <laughs> the answer, my friend, is blowing in the wind. What? That was Bob, man. That was a crazy time in the 60s. So I was born in the 60s. That was my generation starting point. I was born into a generation called the information age. Who here thinks they're part of the information age? Come on. More than that. Come on. Who is part of the information age? A time in the 60s and the 70s and the 80s when we were taught information is power. He who has the most information is deemed to be the smartest. So what did we do? We had telephones, we had televisions. We had encyclopedias, remember those things? Remember those big racks that your grandmother bought you to make you smarter than the next kid? And then your grandfather said, go spend time in the library. Remember that place, the library? Remember it? That's where we got information from. That was just a few years ago. Then we come into this century, wow. Bam. Information meets technology. Advantage us. Cool thing about this age and stage is I have kids 
And so I'm learning this right at about the same time my kids are learning all this. We're learning together. But we now come in to the realm of the smart age, the smart information age. Who here has a smartphone? Who here thinks they're way smarter because they have one? Oh, <laughs> three people. So, so 300 people have smartphones, and three people think they're smarter because of it. That's a pretty good ratio, all right? But we have access to all this information now today. We can get it at our disposal. Information's ubiquitous. It's not always accurate. We can define our own information. We can look at it. We can define it on Wikipedia. The social media platforms we've been talking about are very real. They're useful. They have useful purpose. They've connected where connection didn't happen. But are we smarter as a result of all this information? At what stage do we put a massive check mark on the information age and start to transition to a new age? If at a time in history there's never been more access to information, why is the world so screwed up? Financially, economically, environmentally, socially, geopolitically. The world is not right. And yet, at a time when we've never had access to more information, isn't something wrong? Maybe we have to step back a little bit. Maybe we need to go back to a time when we were younger. When we started thinking about not the information overload age, let's not wait for that to happen. Let's not wait to be overloaded. Let's shift into a simpler time. Let's shift into this age. Let's go from the information age to the question age. Who's asking the hard questions, the right questions, the appropriate questions, or the simple questions? To do that, I challenge you to think like a kid. Think like an eight-year-old. Think about eight-year-olds. I have an eight-year-old son. Hey, check this out for a second. He's eight years old today in Portland, Oregon. His birthday's today, so he's really nine. Think of that for a second. I had to explain that on the phone this morning to him, and he couldn't understand it, but he will one day. So my eight, nine-year-old, I noticed something when I was helping him with his homework. In today's world of academics and education, guess what? All the questions are given. And the kids are asked to provide answers. I thought to myself, kids grow up inquisitive. They want to explore. They ask questions. They're excited. They're not afraid of the answers. Think about it. There's no wrong answer to a kid. As we grow up, as we get older, with information, we start to make assumptions. And with assumptions, we assume other people are going to figure things out. And we assume other people have better questions. But do they? Did the financial community have all the answers? Were the leaders asking the right questions? I'm not sure. But if we think like an eight-year-old, it's interesting. What about the enter the re-era? The re-question, the reinvent, the rethink, the redefine. Check this out. This is a company we have called Keen Footwear. We started off with a simple, simple question. Can a sandal protect your toes? Look at this guy for a second. He's the bad warrior going to Roman Empire, by the way. He's standing there, and the fall of the Roman Empire was because he didn't have toe protection. Look closely. Right there. No toe protection. So we say reinvent it. Reinvent the sandal. Hybrid innovation. Breathability. Toe protection. Let's bring something new to the market. We then say, who's going to wear this? Where do we go? We say, well, mm, what would a kid ask? What would a kid say? A kid would say, well, go outdoors with it. Where's outdoors? It's any place without a ceiling. And who should be involved? And who should be included? Well, everybody can be included. That's how kids think. And then a kid would make up a word and say, well, if it's a hybrid shoe, let's give it to people who live a hybrid life. What's a hybrid life? A hybrid life to us is encouraging people to create, to play, and to care. It's a way of life. Our little company at Keen, we call it hybrid life. It's our philosophy, and we live by it. And from this little simple starting point, it all started with this, a simple question. A man named Rory First, who's been in the footwear business for a long time, came up with a simple twist on the question, can a sandal protect your toes? The answer was yes, and a brand and a business and a movement was started for us. But what is the solution? I say the solution from going 
to the, from the unknown to the known centers around asking the simple question. And the simple question just might be the answer. Think about these shifts that could occur. Check this out. Library? What if we called it the questionary? Hmm. What if the smartphone became the question phone and it could ask the right questions for us? And what if the search engine became the question engine? Find the questions for us. Define them. So when we look forward and we think about the future, in 100 years from now, when we look back at this generation, at this era right now, do we want to be known as the era and the generation that had the most information? Or do we want to be known as the era and the generation that asked the best questions? Do you want your leaders to have the most information? Or do you want your leaders to ask the best questions? I leave you with this. The question is our most powerful tool. It doesn't discriminate. Everyone has it at their disposal. And we're free to ask questions. So what questions are we not asking today that will take us from the unknown to the known? Thanks.